Okay, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh everybody. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Fi buyutin adhina allahu an turfa'a wa yuthkara fiha asmuh. Yusabbihu lahu fiha bil ghuduwi wal asal. رجال لا تلهيهم تجارة ولا بيع عن ذكر الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة يخافون يخافون يوما تتقلب فيه القلوب والأبصار ليجزيهم الله أحسن ما عملوا ويزيدهم من فضله وَاللَّهُ يَرْزُقُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ أعوذ بالله بشار نجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلو الوقت تم لساني يفقه قولي What up everybody? Doing good? Alhamdulillah Good to see you guys So last week we covered uh, the famous Ayat al-Nur who, who was here for last week by the way? Who am I talking to today? Oh, sorry. Last week, meaning anytime I say week, I mean session. Last session, we covered Ethan. Who was here for that? Raise your hands up high, please. Who was not here for that? Raise your hands. Okay, so a few of you. That's fine. Okay, so I'm going to, every. Uh, just so you know, I try to make it so that you miss one. It's not a big deal. We, we'll continue together. So last week, we covered one of the most, if not the most famous example that Allah gives in the Quran. Remember, an example is, in a nutshell, an example that Allah gives is He points to some physical thing but really he's trying to teach you a spiritual lesson. Like the, one of the easiest ones to understand is a lot of the time when Allah talks about rain coming down from the sky and giving life back to the earth and trees growing, it's not really, he's not really, he's talking about rain, but he's really talking about Quran coming down and giving life back to your hearts. That's like an easy example. It's a physical thing. Everyone knows what rain is. A five-year-old can understand rain. And he connects it to something that's in the unseen. Last week was probably one of the most complex examples, if you guys remember. Who, I don't want to do this, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but on like a whole review. But who can tell me what the example was? You don't have to give me all the details because it's a lot. Who can tell me what they remember from the example from last time? Go ahead, Omar. Inside the lamp, it's not lit yet, um, but it has uh, the oil from an olive tree that's not uh, too far to the east or to the west. Like, it's right in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, well, I remember the details, too. <laughs> okay. And uh, the glass is, is really clear, and it's, like, already, like, glistening. Mashal, I was expecting bits and pieces. You gave me the whole thing. Okay, good. So let me just give you an image that's kind of simple without all the details, just so we're all on the same page. Overall, if I were to take a picture of, because Allah, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it's, uh, you're right. It's like the glass, it's, you know, uh, the lamp is in a glass and the oil is from a tree and it's in a house and it's in a niche, which a niche is like the indent on the wall and the glass is spread. Let's just put the details to the side for people that weren't here. If I were to take a picture of what Allah's talking about, you would see a lamp in a house, simply, simply put. You'd see a lamp in a house, an old style lamp where there's glass around it. The important, the important piece, I, the detail I do want to point out is the glass. So there's a bit of a flame. There's a lamp around, a glass around it. What's one of the purposes of the glass, by the way, around the flame? <laughs> to protect the flame. So you can't just go and then the flame goes away, right? So we understand that, right? And the idea of that is when Allah used the word misbah, a misbah is a lamp, a lamp, or you can think of like even a light bulb. The word misbah is a tool, it's an ism ala, which means it's something, it's meant to mimic the morning, subah, misbah like subah. It's meant to mimic the morning, meaning when morning isn't here, you have a misbah. When you don't have subah, you have misbah. Does that make sense? Okay. So if the purpose of a lamp in, the, in a home is to illuminate when there's no sun, then Allah is saying, just like that physical reality, the purpose of your heart, which is also like a lamp in an indent in the chest, which is the same shape as a niche, by the way, the purpose of this is to illuminate people around you when there's darkness. You understand? So now every time you look at a lamp or a light bulb, you're not just thinking about a lamp or a light bulb, you're thinking about your own heart, your own purpose in life, actually. And then in that example, he even said that this, this oil from this lamp, it came from somewhere else. 
Let's, we don't go into the details of the tree right now. Meaning this ruh inside you, the soul inside of you, is not of this earth. You cannot explain this away with evolution. You cannot explain this away with, you know, different iterations of human beings growing and like how giraffes' necks get longer. This is not where this came from. This is something that no other animal has. Some abilities that you have, no other animal has. Your ability to speak, for example, no other animal has. They can mimic, but they can't speak like we do. They can't understand like we do. They don't build communities like we do. You understand? So this thing is from somewhere else. Remember, we got that from the oil. Okay, so is the imagery clear? Just so we can move on. I don't want to do a review of last time. If you want, you can watch that video. We're clear on the imagery. Okay, inshallah. A couple things about that imagery, because here's, again, I, 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 I repeat things a lot, but so does Quran, because repetition is good for believers, Allah says, yeah? Okay. Or reminders are good for believers. So I want to remind you something, the purpose of examples when Allah gives them. It's not just a cool riddle. That's not the point. Allah does not give you things because it's just interesting. It, like Some people are like, yo, I heard that aliens are in the Quran. Can you show me the ayah? Dude, who cares? That's not the point. It's to tickle your fancy. <laughs> who cares? If it, what does that do for you if it is? What does it matter to you? It doesn't benefit you at all. So when Allah gives an example like this, we have to go back to, okay, why is Allah giving me an example? Even by the end, He even says, in this ayah, I'm giving the example for your benefit. Allah strikes examples for the people. Okay, so now we have to be like, ya Allah, okay, why do we have this example again? The purpose of it is that now every time you see a flame burning, a campfire, a light bulb, a projector screen, and you're looking at the light, you're thinking of your own heart. That's the purpose. And I want to give you an example of this. This is just my own thing. One thing I didn't mention last time. So I was at the, the community dinner, and they had this fancy glass, literally, like the, like the example. They had this a glass, and they had a flame, a little candle inside the glass. So literally almost exactly like the example. You're following so far. It's just a glass, and in it is this floating, this, this little uh, flame in a candle, okay? And subhanAllah, again, trying to, trying to really use the example Allah gave me, I started just looking and thinking about the ayah. This was like two, a couple days after I taught it to you guys. It might have been the day after, was it? When was the dinner? The week after. It was a week after. But I'm still trying to apply like, what we learned and trying to connect it to real life. So I'm looking at like, what other benefit is there that's not very obvious from the words. And I notice, subhanAllah, obviously you have this glass and people were touching it, right? So there's smudges on the glass. But I didn't notice the smudges and the dust and the dirt until like the, the flame had kind of like a tall tail and it was like waving back and forth. And the, the impurities of the glass was only clear when the flame went towards it. Does that make sense? So when the fire was close to one side of the glass, the filth on the glass became more clear. Do you get where I'm get, you know where I'm getting at here? And then when it went to the other side, then I'm like, oh, now I can see that guy's fingerprint. It's filthy. It looks clean from far away, but the, gla the, the fire, the light made it so clear. Actually, I see a lot of dirt. Now, how do you connect this back to the spiritual lesson? The ruh inside you, the light, literally, the ruh is made of light. Where the body is made of dirt, the ruh is made of light. This light inside of you is actually supposed to make it super clear to you where you need some cleaning, if you pay attention to it. Meaning you're in salah, and someone's reciting an ayah to you, or teaching you an ayah, or someone reminds you something, that light, that flame inside of you, should make it super clear, I got a smudge there. I have a quick temper. I need to lower my gaze. I'm a little bit too loose with the tongue. I need to stop cheating people in business. That's the benefit of the light Allah gave you. Otherwise, we would just be perpetually filthy. In this surah, even Allah says that if he, he didn't have to guide you. He didn't have to purify you. But he gave you the light to purify you. So that's something that we get from that example, even though something that I kind of saw. Another little, uh, something, some more things about the glass. Obviously, a glass is clear both ways. You can, if you were on one side of the glass, like literally a window, if someone was standing outside like a creep, I can see them, probably him, and he can see me. <laughs> we can see each other because the glass is clear. What does that mean for us? The believer, I think I might have told you this last time, but a Muslim, a believer, should be extremely one-faced. We cannot be two-faced. My inside should match my outside. Who I am on the outside should match who I am on the inside. We are not two-faced people. Yeah? 
The word I want to use for this that maybe this side won't like very much, but I'm, I like this word is vulnerable. You guys have heard vulnerable before, okay? Vulnerable just means that I allow people in and I don't mind telling people where they're wrong as well. That's vulnerability, actually. Where I don't mind that you see inside me. I don't mind that you can see who I am. You know the phrase, for example, we say in English, I wear my heart on my sleeve. We wear our hearts on our sleeve. Something bothers us, we say. Something's wrong, and we talk out loud. If someone calls us out, we don't try to cover it up. Oh, no, 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 you don't understand. Oh, it's a, it's a long story. No, 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 you're like, you know what, you're right, I messed up. We're vulnerable in that way. We're like, we're, we're clear because of the, the glass example that Allah gave. And then finally, just one thing I want to reiterate that we did say in detail last time, but it's just such an important part of it. The problem with the glass, we said, was it can be dirty. It can be so dirty, in fact, that the light cannot escape from inside and no light can come from outside. That is, Allah says, for example, that their hearts are just rusted over. They've accumulated so much filth and they just never cleaned it. Like if you ever left your bicycle when you were a kid outside and it rained and then the next day, you know, you didn't clean it or you didn't wipe it down. You didn't dry it up. You didn't put it back in the garage, even though your dad told you over and over. This is personal to me. But then you leave it outside and it rained, it rained, it rained. And then by the end of the month, your bike is useless because it rusted over. The pedal fell off. The handlebar doesn't work. It's dangerous to sit on it. The same thing that if you don't keep the heart in check, the filth that accumulates on the heart in check on this glass, protecting the ruh, you don't keep it in check, eventually you won't even remember that there's light in there. Because it wants to get out, it's still there, Allah put it in you, the ruh. But the light's not escaping because you're filthy inside. There's filth, there's too much filth. And even light from outside, meaning you sit in a lecture about Quran and it doesn't hit you. Like you get it up here. Oh yeah, the light and the niche. And I know every word. I memorized it even. Who cares if you memorized it? None of it went in the qalb. So who cares? What did you benefit from it? You learned a bunch of pretty words in Arabic. Congratulations. Who cares? It didn't even penetrate you. The idea is when it's filthy, no advice, not even Allah's advice, by the way, will you listen to. Like think how crazy that is. What other advice is there that can penetrate the heart? But that's how filthy we can become. The idea is that we're supposed to constantly clean this glass. And the number one way will be clear as we continue with this, inshallah. I don't, again, I don't want it to be a review. Any questions about this or any other reflections about the glass example before we move on? Because I want to leave it behind now. No other, I, I'll leave it open. Like any other thoughts that come to mind about the example that we didn't cover? No? Okay. All right. I'm sure there's something someone's just too shy to say. We'll move on though, okay? How we're gonna do today is there's two ayahs after this glass example that talks about certain homes that Allah's praising. So we'll talk about like what homes is he talking about? We'll talk about that. Next week, and I, here I mean literally next week, okay? Next week, inshallah, we're gonna be covering the last two ayahs of this passage where it talks not about light, but darkness. And that's a very deep conversation that I'm really excited for. But this week I want to talk about like, how, what, do the, what does this light look like is what we're going to talk about today, okay? So Allah continues, fi bu he continues somewhere, there it is. Fi buyutin, in homes, in houses. A, a bait is a house. You've heard the word bait before. Now again, this goes back, there's multiple words for the word bait. Like even in modern Arabic, what's another way to say come to my house? Like, Dar, you can say dar. Okay, so why didn't Allah use dar? Why did he use bait? A bait, specifically, in old Arabic at least, is a place you are going to spend the night. Which is so appropriate for what was just talked about. Because the example that was literally given was a lamp in a niche, which a niche doesn't exist outside. No one has a random niche on the middle of the highway. That's not how we light things anymore. We put it in a house. And Allah literally is saying, fi buyutin. This whole example of a light illuminating through the glass and even through the glass of a window, for example, is happening in houses. So he says, fi buyut, meaning a place you're going to spend the night. Um, so now the imagery is a little bit expanded more, where now it's like you're in a neighborhood and some houses are dark, as if no one's in there. And then some, there's so much light that is coming through the window. And you, you become, a, imagine there's no, no, no light at all except for the light coming from that house. So then you're naturally attracted to that house. You understand the imagery? There's, there's something, I, I, forgive me, I forget who to attribute this to, but it was a scholar, Rahimahullah, who said, uh, may Allah be pleased with him, whoever he is, that said that, on the, and basically what he said was, in this world, 
you have human beings looking up at night to the light of the stars. And they're like, whoa, look at that one. And that one's twinkling and that one's so bright. And sometimes they fade in and out. And they're just looking up and they're amazed by the stars. And he said, the people, the ones that live in the skies and the heavens, meaning the angels, they look down at the earth and they're amazed by the light of the earth. Now, what is the light of the earth? Are not the houses you, like, for example, if you've like been on a plane at night before, you, you guys know what I'm talking about? If you're on a plane at night, you're not looking at the stars. You're more interested in what? Look at those houses down there. If you were down by the houses, you'd be like, who cares? Like, I want to go home. But in, the, in an airplane, you're like, whoa, look at all the lights on. And the angels are looking down with that same amazement, but they're not amazed by lights flicked on. They're amazed by certain homes where Allah is mentioned. Or by certain people, men and women, who their hearts are illuminated and they're looking down like, that one's bright. Did you see that one? That one's fading in and out. He lost it a little bit, but he came back. If you look at these, they're, they're making a constellation, meaning they got together and they're, they're making even more light. They're making patterns together. They built a masjid. They made a program. The same way that we see constellations and make like these, you know, people have like four dots and call it a bear somehow. But you get the, you know what I mean? I still, the, NASA explained it to me. I still don't get it. But <laughs> when we were at Grand Canyon. Um, but you get the idea. Looking down, they're, they're finding constellations and these different people with their light illuminating from their chest. Okay, subhanAllah. So, fi buyutin adhin Allahu an turfaha, that Allah decreed, allowed that they should be raised. These homes Allah's talking about. Now, what are these homes? We'll get to in a second. Okay, because there's a couple ways to think about it. But fi buyutin adhin Allahu an turfaha, houses, homes that Allah permitted that they should be raised. Wa yudkaru fi hasmu, wa yudkaru fi hasmu, actually, that, that his name should be remembered in them. Now, let's talk about what. What's, what, are, what are these houses? Do you guys hear an echo? That's a crazy echo. Okay. Sorry, I have like the shortest attention span. We'll love a squirrel. Um, houses, yes? So what are these houses that Allah's talking about that they should be raised? And by the way, raised, not literally, they should be raised and elevated above other houses physically, but spiritually they are raised above other, of other houses. Meaning when the angels look down, they notice these raised homes flooding with light. Yuzgaru fi hasmuhu. You know, they, they're being raised. Now, what are these buyut? Um, actually, I'll get to that in a second. That's going to come in a second. With Qur'an Fasmu, يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ فِيهَا بِالْغُدُوِ وَالْأَصَالِ Inside these homes, his na- he is being exonerated. يُسَبِّحُ Tasbih is being made for him. We'll talk about Tasbih in a second. Tasbih is being made for him. He's being praised. بِالْغُدُوِ asal. Late in the night and early in the morning before the sun comes out. Okay? Now, tasbih. Uh, so, so far, we have a house. We don't know whose house. We don't know what house. We have some building. And inside this building, what's being happening? First of all, it's being raised. Second of all, Allah is being remembered. And there's tasbih happening inside the house. And what is tasbih? Tasbih literally is like saying, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah. Everyone say, Allahu Akbar. These are, by the way, so much more powerful than we're taught. These are, these are saved from Jahannam powerful, these things. Yeah, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha Allah. These are powerful declarations that we're making. Allah says that birds and mountains and ants and dirt and the wind and clouds, they have their own language with praising Allah. Like Allahu Anam, but if you ever see like birds flying in that formation, that could be their tasbih for all we know. We don't know for sure, but that could be their way of praising Allah. That's the way that they're taught in their animal instincts. For us, we're taught specific things. So, and that is subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, it's Quran, it's Allah, it's these things. So they're doing tasbih. What does tasbih actually mean though? Literally, this is really interesting, it means um, to float. Like, remember, like, you know, sabaha, like what sabaha mean? To swim. Back in the day in old Arabic, it's not necessarily to swim, but to, but to float. So it's as if like, you imagine like if you have like a ball and you drop it in water, what happens to the ball? It floats. Even if you were to bring it down as much as you can to the bottom of the ocean, if as, lo- as far down as you want towards the earth's core, what, all, what will always happen to that ball? It ends up where? You let it go? It ends up on top. Like I was doing a, a science experiment with my niece because I had a pumpkin in my house. And she was like, we're at school, we're talking about whether or not things float or sink underwater. She doesn't snore, but in my head she snorts. So I got a thing of water and I put the pumpkin in. And because the pumpkin's hollow, it floats because there's air in the pumpkin. She was like, whoa. And even when she tried to push it down, she's like, I'll, she literally was like, I'll make it sink. You know, I'll make it sink. And she pushed it down. And what happened to the pumpkin? It got back up. 
And she still called it sinking because she put it down, but it, it didn't sink. Okay, she's wrong. The point is, no matter what you do to the pumpkin, it'll always end up where? On top. Tasbih is declaring Allah's perfection because no matter what filthy man or woman tries to bring Allah's name down, everything is doing tasbih. Even if every man, woman, and child were off the face of the earth, were wiped off the face of the earth, birds and mountains and ants and the earth and the wind and the clouds are still declaring his perfection. And even if you got rid of all that stuff, he maintains his own perfection. He doesn't even need to do it. But this tasbih is declaration of Allah's perfection. And what does that do to you? It cleans you up. It illuminates you. This cleans you. Just as a quick advice, after salah, after every fard salah is recommended, you do subhanAllah, if you know this, you know, but subhanAllah 33 times, and then alhamdulillah, the same amount 33 times, and then Allahu Akbar 33 times. is recommended even just to kind of get tasbih in. The Prophet ﷺ, for example, you know, it's narrated he would do, say, istighfar, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, and it's narrated 70 times a day, which could, could mean 70 times, it could just mean he did it literally all the time. Like if you ever met someone that they like poured water and they're like, astaghfirullah, or like they got a tissue and said, alhamdulillah. It's not that they did anything wrong, but they're just remembering him so much. They just are constant. they're so into it, they're so aware of him, that they're just constantly saying astaghfirullah, alhamdulillah, but even if it doesn't make sense to do so at that, to you at least, in that moment to do so. These people in these homes are making that yusabihu lahu fiha bil ghudu al-ashal. Late at night, early in the morning, meaning it's as if Allah is the last thing they remember before they go to sleep, first thing they remember when they wake up. That's kind of the imagery. And by the way, they're doing tasbih when it's dark out. Just like the example was, light is used when there's no sun. They're illuminating the world even at the darkest times. That's who these people are. They're bringing light out at dark times, spiritual dark times, where people, the light can't escape and they're frustrated. You know, for example, the body is made of dirt and the food that the body eats also comes from the same dirt, the same earth. Water comes from the earth, you know, food comes from the dirt, and they sustain their body through that dirt. But we have a crisis in humanity where you have the ruh, which is made of light, and it doesn't eat burgers and chips, and it doesn't watch entertainment, and it doesn't take these things from the earth. It needs spiritual food, food that's made of light. First and foremost being the Quran. And we're starving ourselves. We starve ourselves with that darkness. And we're supposed to be examples for everyone else. Remember when I told you, by the way, about the glass? That the outside is supposed to match the inside? This tasbih that we're supposed to do, the salah that we're supposed to be doing, is supposed to not just be something on the inside. It's supposed to flood light on the outside through our character as well, that we change. Literally to the point, and you've heard this either about yourself or about someone else, where some mother or some father talks about their son or daughter. I don't even know who they are anymore. They used to yell at me all the time. <laughs> They used to be such a terrible kid, basically, you know? And now they're just like, they're, they're respecting me and they're giving me hugs and they get me water before I even ask. And just these, like, what's wrong with them? Something's wrong with my kid. Like that kind of ordeal, you know? Where people recognize a change in you, that change comes from here, come from here, from this tasbih. And that light, everyone is supposed to notice. Just like in the example where someone's walking, and I know I've said this three times, but it's just so important. Just like the example someone's, that Allah gave where someone's walking down the street and sees it's so dark and they can't see, they can't even, Allah says in the other examples that it's so dark that they're tiptoeing forward. They're blind in the dark. And all of a sudden, someone of light comes in and they're like, whoa. It's as if I can see myself more clearly, clearly because of this woman. It's as if I can see myself more clearly because of this man walking in. You understand? You are supposed to be that torch for other people through the tasbih emanating through your character. Okay. Now, the next ayah. يُسَبِّحُ لَهُ فِيهَا بِالْغُدُوِ وَالْأَصَالِ رِجَالٌ Now, here's where things, this is interesting. Men. Who's doing the tasbih in these homes? Specifically, Allah saying, رِجَالٌ Men. لَا تُلْهِيهِمْ تِجَارَةٌ وَلَا بَيْعٌ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Business and sales do not uh, uh, do not let them distract, thank you, distract them I got distracted, do not distract them from the remembrance of Allah men are specifically being called out here, okay so that's one thing, here, now let's go back to the houses, what are these houses that these men are doing this of Allah in 
I'll, I'll share one thing and then I'm going to share what's also a very popular opinion. Okay, the first thing is this the word Allah says is buyutin. Okay, if Allah said, and when, by the way, what, what houses are these that He's talking about? Like, if you were to guess, what houses are these? Yeah, a masjid. A masjid. Like, what other house is there that, people, that men are inside and they're like what we just did upstairs? Literally, rijanun, men that are not distracted by business are in there doing tasbih of Allah. That's literally what just happened to Aisha just right now. What will happen at Fajr, inshallah, in a few hours from now? That's what, that's what this is. So, the first thing that comes to mind is it's obviously buyutin, buyut, buyutillah. The houses of Allah, like the Kaaba is called the Bait of Allah, the Masjid is the house of Allah. We say the house of, we know this, the house of, the, the house of Allah. Obviously not that he lives in it, that he owns it. Obviously, that's, you know, what doesn't have to be said. Regardless, the thing is, if he said, Fil buyut, Allahu an turfa, right? Or Fil buyut allati, adhina Allah. Al-Buyut, the houses are different than houses, especially in Arabi, in the Quran, or especially rather in the Quran. Like Allah could have said in the houses, but He didn't. He said fi buyutin, meaning in any houses, unknown houses even. This, what this does for us basically is it does, it expands the meaning. So yes, it means houses of Allah, meaning masajid, but it also means your house. It also means anything. By the way, a masjid is literally, and this is even in fiqh, by the way, a masjid is just a place where sajda happens. Like, we don't have this thing that, for example, when Christians build a church, they have to, like, I don't know, they do things with holy water, they say a prayer, and then it's a church, for example. No. A masjid is just any place, any location where you do an intention of literally just doing sajda. Masjid, sajda. A place of doing sajda is a masjid. So in my living room, I live in a little apartment. The li my living room, I have a spot where I pray. That's my masjid. So even my apartment could be these buyut in Adin Allah and Turfa. That, that at night when I'm praying Isha with my wife, and we're reciting out loud, by the way, my apartment could be the house that is taken out of the building and it's being raised spiritually. The angels are going, wow, look at them. They're really into it right now. Look at that light down there. Your house even. Anyone's house. <laughs> and it's like, no, not my house. Any house at all, any house whatsoever. It could be, for example, a house where someone, they're, they're secretly Muslim in their house, and if their dad, mom found out, they would kill them, for example. A convert that you and I don't even know that they're Muslim. Allah takes that house, that little room even, their room specifically, and raises them in ranks. The angels are praising them. Man, look at her, look at him. So, buyutin, generally any house. Now, of course, also, especially because men are mentioned, it could also be the masjid. And that's obvious, I think, too, that it's also alluding to the masajid. And by the way, of course, it's good to pray in your house. It is extra good, especially, especially for men. There's a special expectation even of men specifically that women don't have this. For example, Jummah, you guys don't have to go to Jummah. We don't have a choice. Like, I, I one time, no offense, Wallah, at all. And I, I, just to be super, super clear, masjid should have room for women, and obviously it should like, there are some masjid that like what women have is like a closet that's like filthy, for example. Obviously, I don't think that that's a pro proper thing. But at the same time, there was, uh, someone made a comment that like, why don't women have the same exact amount of room as men do? And I'm like, y'all aren't expected the way that we are. Like, we have to go. We have, we must be there. Literally, if you miss three Jummah Salahs, you're considered a, like there's a hadith that it's, it's, it's of hypocrisy to do so, to be a munafiq. Like this is wajib on men that they have to be there. But even there is a, a little bit of, um, there is a, a very, not a little bit, there's a strong push, especially here in this surah, in this passage and in hadith, that men should go to the masjid. For Aisha, for Fajr, we should be there, like fil ghudui wal asan, like Allah is saying right here. That's what he's pushing us to do. There's a special expectation here. And by the way, it also calls out that the, a lot of things happen in a masjid, especially our masjid. Like right now we're learning in this masjid, for example. Or sometimes we have like a wake up, we have, there's a wellness center or there's like, you know, some event with politics or whatever the case may be. But the primary purpose of a masjid is yudhkaru fi hasmuhu. That Allah's name should be remembered. That's the primary purpose. Any masjid where that's not the primary purpose is a failure. You can do what other, whatever events you want. But if no one's showing up to Isha or to Fajr, that's a failed community, even you can say. I don't care how together you are. You're not coming together for the purpose of this masjid. That's not to, by the way, diminish anything else, but the primary purpose of this. 
or men and women, when they go to the masjid, they, they like what we're doing right now, inshallah, we're putting everything else to the side, we're remembering Allah. That's what the purpose of this is, okay? Now, let me talk about the houses thing for a second. There, because a question kind of comes up is like, why did Allah say rijal here? That, that's a question that I had. Allah could have said nasun, la tulhihim tijaratun wa la bayan. People. He specifically called out males, like men here. He could have said people, in, meaning including men and women. People who business does not distract them go to the masjid. But he called out men specifically. A couple things about this, and this is, by the way, where a lot of it is my own thinking. So please, you, you know, I'm, I, don't take everything I say as like the only way to think of things, obviously. That's, we should never reduce Quran to that. That Quran is what this specific scholar or speaker says. No, that's a very silly way to think about a lot of Quran. Some of Quran is very specific. There's no room for interpretation. Allah is one. Sorry, there's only one way to look at that. There's no in interpretation where someone can be like, actually, it's a trinity. No, that's very dumb. That's not what he's saying. It's very, very clear. But then there are other parts where different scholars, different people even, can come together and be like, well, I, I make a case for this. So it, I say this because... There's a big movement in our community where people are being extremely fundamentalist. Where it's like, only my sheikh is right about what Quran is saying. Dude, that's like... You know what Allah says about Quran, by the way? Allah gives an example about Quran that if you had an ocean of ink and you started writing... And by the way, writing the signs, the ayat of Allah. And he doesn't just mean writing like Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah ar-Rahim. But he means writing all the benefit, all the things that you can get from even one ayah then you would run out of ink, run out of the ocean, how deep the ocean is before you're even done with an ayah. And you're telling me only your scholars write about what's, come on, I mean, sometimes it's actually very silly. Anyway, so I just mean to say that to be academically honest that this is not the only way to think of things. I'm sure you'll hear other things, by the way. Okay, why are men being called out? There's a couple of things that I thought of. Number one, Surah an nur is, oh, I highly recommend you read it. It's such a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful surah. And there's one special commandment specifically in this surah that is specific for women. Who knows what that commandment is? Hijab. Very good. Very good. That comes from Surah Nur. By the way, hijab, because there's yani, filthy people that claim that hijab is not in Quran. Mashallah, how amazing they are. It's not called hijab, actually. Hijab is used as like a, it literally means a cover, like a wall between people. It's called khimar in the book. Khimar is where it's called out. So you, if you're going to look for it, it's called, it's, Khimar is the word. But that's not the point. We'll talk about hijab, inshallah, sometime later. About the ayah of hijab, inshallah. I, I can't wait to talk about that with you guys. But for now, you have that special expectation. that Do, do men enter that expectation at all? No. In fact, that uh, just a sneak peek of like how Allah words it. That expectation that you guys have that these guys don't have. Or you girls have that these guys don't have. Yeah. Is not even about them. It's so sad, so sad. It's wallahi so sad. One time I was in a psychology class in high school and someone asked a Muslim girl next to me, why do you guys have to wear the hijab? Simple. I'm sure you guys have heard that from everybody, even family members. And then, you know, this is a little bit too far, but um, she said that it's so we don't get uh, sexually harassed, basically. And I'm like, no, no. You guys do not wear hijab because of us. You don't. This is not tied to them. It's tied to who? It's tied to Allah. You do this, and I can't wait to talk to you guys about it soon, inshallah, to put something in you that men do not experience, put it to the side for his sake. The same way that we have sp something not specific to us, but special about us. You guys are told to lower your gaze, by the way, in the surah, in surah al-Nur, before this ayah. You're told to lower your gaze. You're told twice to lower your gaze in the surah. It's so funny. Allah's amazing. He'll be like, you believing men, literally, believing men, lower your gaze. And he'll be like, you believing women, lower your gaze. And then you lower your gaze. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning what? There's something especially messed up about us that we have to lower your gaze twice. But you guys have something else where sometimes beauty, where sometimes value, you interpret it through your own beauty. And Allah's like, you're going to put that to the side. You're going to get your value from me. You're not going to get it from people, what people expect of you. What a beautiful thing. How dumb, is, how dumb of us to be like, we do it so men do look at it. What are you talking about? That's not what this is for. Something distracting behind me? No. That's not what that's for. 
That's a special expectation of women. Now, bringing it back to this, this is now a special expectation on who? Men. And I want you to, first of all, the masjid. We have a special expectation about the masjid, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Like, we, and I, I don't I mean, well, I hope I'm not a hypocrite, inshallah. I need to do better with this, so just to call myself out. But we need to do better with this collectively, that the masjid should be full of men always. That's the, the gauge of health of a community is that men are at the masjid, they praise Allah, they talk to each other afterwards, and they connect afterwards too. That's, that's what the masjid should look like. But here, there's another special thing. If you think of buyut, these houses Allah is talking about, as not this specific house, and we'll do this and we'll take a break, inshallah, but your houses, I'll even say, your homes and your homes, the homes where families live inside of. You know what's amazing, by the way? I, I had to like read Nur again before this just to kind of like get some themes. Two ayahs before this, before ayat al Nur, Allah is talking about getting permission from a family to enter a house. And then he said, if there no one lives in that house, then it's okay for you to go inside. Okay. Why do I mention this? A common theme of Surah An-Nur actually are houses full of people, meaning who? Families. So he connects the idea of light and maintaining light to families. You, you understand the connection here? So he's saying families are the first Role of defense, the glass you can even argue, of the ruh, families, protect each other. And who is the primary stakeholder? Who is the primary person responsible in a household for the light of their house? Rijalun. La tulhihim tijaratun wa la bayran dhikrillah. This is now a special expectation, not on you. You guys are carrying it, just look at our numbers. You guys are carrying it on your backs right now, actually, I would argue. That if you go to a household, who is the one in the household making sure that the kids are praying and the kids know Allah and the kids are learning Arabic to read Quran for themselves and the kids are blah, blah, blah. Who, who's doing it? The men? You guys. Right now it's you guys. That's a shame on us though. Allah is saying the men should be in charge of that. The men should be the, first, should be the soldiers that protect the light in their homes. That's not to say you don't have a responsibility, by the way. I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is, imagine this, that Allah raises a family in front of him. Men, women, children. And the children don't pray, and the wife doesn't pray, the man doesn't pray. Who's going to be the first? Uh, everyone's accountable, don't get me wrong. It's not like, halas, the kids are good, and the wife is good, and the man's the only one getting punished. They're all going to get punished for it. But who's going to be the one asked specifically, what did you do wrong? The man of the house, spiritually speaking. Where were you? Look what they went off and did. And sometimes, of course, it's not the fault of the, 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 the man or the wife, the husband or the wife, that their kids go and do whatever they do. It's not their fault. Think of Nuh, alayhi salam. He couldn't, he couldn't do anything for his son. Where he's like, a mountain will protect me from Allah, Safa. What are you talking about? Like, look who your dad is. Look who you are. Well, how did you fail so much, mashallah? He's, you're amazing how terrible you are as a son. But still, if no attempt was made by especially the husband, to protect the light of his household, that's on us. Rijalun la tulhihim. They're not distracted enough from business and from sales. La tulhihim tijaratun wa la bayhun an dhikrillah. Meaning that you remember Allah and your household, your bait remembers Allah. You're the, you're the ones at the front line making sure your wife is standing in salah, that your wife, that your kids, you know, you're not all of you are married, but you have to remember this for the future, inshallah, if you're not. You are the primary source of, you're supposed to be the primary source of education for your wives, you, you guys, and for your kids. I will be completely upfront, I'm cheating right now, Allah, and I mean this, I'm, I'm literally cheating, which is totally fine. When I do this, I am literally kind of, I don't really gauge it by your faces, I gauge it by her face. <laughs> Because she's my prime, so I'm cheating. Like I get to do this and do kill two birds, one stone or feed two birds, one stone and shall not kill. Um, so I'm kind of like, I'm, it's cool if you guys show up or not, but me and Asil will talk about it because I have a responsibility for her actually first. I'm supposed to be teaching her. That's my responsibility. That if, for example, she has an incorrect understanding, I'm supposed to go and find that. Like we think of men as, oh, we're supposed to just be providers. And, you know, our fathers, unfortunately, in our past, past uh, uh, you know, 
recent ancestors made a, such a huge psychological social mistake where they're like, yeah, I gave my kids everything they ever wanted. You know where how I grew up? I had two sandals and one of them had a rat always on it biting it that I couldn't get rid of and I had to walk uphill both ways to school and I came to America with five dollars in my pocket and I gave you your iPhone. How dare you disobey me? It's such a dejanic way, such a one-eyed way, a materialistic way of looking at the role of a man. Yes, that's the role of a man that you provide, that you work. By the way, literally, that you work. Business is mentioned. You're doing business. You're making sales. But it doesn't distract you from the other eye. That you're spiritually supposed to be a provider as well. The same way that you go out and hunt and get money to come and feed your wife and kids. When they have questions, you're supposed to go hunt and get them answers. Get your own education. And come back and provide them with that nur. Literally, actually, it's, I, now that it's actually kind of beautiful. The beginning, one of, not the beginning, but Musa a.s. when he's going from Median back to Egypt, there's literally this, this story that literally happens where his wife and his kids and him are traveling in the middle of the desert. And is there light or no light? There's no light. He doesn't have any light. And then he sees a light. In the, you guys know this famous story. He sees a light in the distance. What does he do? Does he say, oh, you're the wife, it's your responsibility to get life for the kids, you go get it, I'm going to sit right here, I had a long day at work, and like Homer Simpson the rest of the night? No. He's like, literally, you stay here, I'll go get a qabas. I'll go borrow their light, and I'll come back and give it to you. And you might say, well, Shadi, that's a, spirit, that's a physical light. He literally got revelation from Allah when he went. It's kind of on the nose. He literally got spiritual nur and came back and gave it to them. So he did both, by the way, the physical and the spiritual. And what, what do we do? Because we're so dejalic, we're so one-eyed, that we see the material and not the spiritual, that we say because we got our kids an iPhone, we're, do we're done. We're, we succeeded. What a failure. What a failure of a man we would be if that's our mentality. We'll end it there. Um, sorry for making fun of you. We'll, we'll take a quick break for f four minutes. 9.16, we'll come back. There's coffee and snacks in the back, and we'll, uh, we'll come back, inshallah. And say, okay, so we talked about Rijal. Why are Rijal mentioned? We talked about that kind of expectation of men being spiritual leaders in their households. I think I made that clear, yes? I want to end it with the, with the end of this, and inshallah, we'll wrap it up, do some reflections, and we'll, uh, we'll call it a night, inshallah. Uh, actually, to be fair, two more things. So first, Allah put a special description, descriptor on these men that I want to pause at a little bit. He described these men with the sentence, لا تلهيهم تجارة excuse me, ولا بيع عن ذكر الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء زكاة. لا تلهيهم تجارة تجارة in, in بيع business does not distract them. We'll talk about distract from what. Business does not distract them and making the sale does not distract them. So the actual sale itself does not distract them from the remembrance of Allah. What does that mean? First of all, Sale is part of the business. So why did Allah, you know, that's part, literally part, the purpose of business is making sale. So why did Allah call both of them out? You can say that the, the tijara part is about like anything to do with the business, right? Like accounts receivable, accounts payable, uh, the marketing, the merchandising, the putting the shelves exactly right so people are attracted, the whatever, like all that, okay? The what advertising, all that kind of stuff, okay? And all that's work, the payroll, all that's just work. It's just work to get to what juicy final part the sale. That's what you really want. That's the part that feels good. Allah is saying business does not distract them. They can put that even to the side as much as they work and as much as they're into their job or whatever. By the way, I will call out uh, two things. Number one, just because this is a main expectation of men, I don't think that necessarily means it's not an expectation of yours. So I want to call that out first of all. They're just supposed to be an example of it. So I just want to call that out first. The second part is, even if you don't own a business, when you work, you're a part of a business. So I just want to call that out. Because in the beginning, I was like, I don't own a business. This doesn't apply to me. I can't get distracted by tijara because I don't have a tijara. That's not the case. If you work in a corporation, you work for a business. And that business, a lot of the time, can really consume your mind especially sometimes for men, where like all you think about is the project that's due next week or your boss stepping on your head and calling you dumb or whatever the case may be. And you're so obsessed with the work that you have to do that sometimes it can even lead you to forgetting Allah entirely or not going to Aisha or not even praying at all sometimes. Allah is saying real men do not get distracted by their jobs. I'll give you a quick story about this. So 
as pathetic as it is, my first job was Dunkin' Donuts, okay? So I, I think I told you guys this like seven times, but I worked at Dunkin' Donuts. But I, didn't, I never told this story though. So at Dunkin', it was my first day at the job. And, uh, you know, back in the day, I think minimum wage, like already was what, like 850? 850 or something, what is it now? Like 13 or something? Okay, this is like before like hyperinflation. So it was like 850. But Duncan, because it's so mashallah upper echelon, it had a probation period for three months where you get paid 650. Legally somehow. Anyway, so my first day on the job, I got paid 650 an hour. But I was like, I can't wait to work for you, sir. Like I'm so excited because I'm young and dumb. Okay, so I'm working at Dunkin' Donuts. My first day was actually I was scheduled for Friday in the afternoon. Now what's the problem with that? I'm gonna miss Jummah. But I was so nervous because I just got the job that I'm like, Jum is gonna have to wait. Like, I'm sure Allah will understand, because I just got a job, and I'm getting paid 650, dude. <laughs> okay? So I go, and then I go to the halakha, actually, Ahmed Safa, the next day, because that was a Friday, so I go to the halakha on Saturday. And then he was like, where were you at Jummah? I was like, I had work. He's like, how much did you get paid at work? And I'm like, 650. I'm like, so you sold out Allah for 650. I was like, damn. I never scheduled myself on Friday again. <laughs> Stuff with Allah, Allah, forgive me. But that's how like even small business, like taking out the trash and getting the right kind of donut with sprinkles on the side, like that stupid little job can distract you. It can be a distraction. But Allah is saying, no matter what business, even at the time of the sale, they don't get distracted. Now, what does that mean the time at the sale? It's like you set everything up and your inventory is just sitting there and you're so stressed out, like how am I going to get my money back? And then finally at, at, at 11.50 p.m. at the shop, some guy comes in and gets a cart full of stuff, like all the stuff you were afraid you weren't going to sell. And you're like in your, in your, in your head, every time he fills the cart, cha-ching, cha-ching, cha-ching. And it's 12.50 and you have to go to Juma. That man is supposed to be like, sir, I'm really sorry. I'm have to close up. I have to go. What kind of customer service is this? Can't you see I'm doing your business? Sir, I'm really sorry. This is above me and you. I have to go. I'm leave it in the cart. You're going to have to leave. I'm going to have to lock up. Like to that extent. Men of discipline. That even the most, one of the most precious things to men is money. I'm sorry, but it is, it's money. It's one of the most precious things. Allah gives a top five, a, a list of five things men love. Number one is women. And then two of the three are, have to do with wealth. Two, two or three of the five have to do with wealth. But even when they see like the dollar signs in their eyes, they, they shove it off and they're like, you know what? No, I have to go to Jummah. I'm not going to miss Jummah for this. That extent. Okay? So men of priority, Ani. I think we talked about that enough. So they don't get distracted. The, and, you know, the business and the sale don't distract them from what? On dhikrillah, on the remembrance of Allah. Wa iqam salah and constantly establishing the salah. They do not miss a salah because of business, because of work. Wa ita is zakah, nor giving zakat, giving charity. Meaning no matter how well they're doing or how bad they're doing in business, they are giving charity, they're giving money away. It doesn't matter if they're doing very well or they're not doing very well at all. They are giving zakat, they are giving charity. يَخَافُونَ يَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا They fear a day in which تَتَقَلَّبُ فِيهِ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبْصَارِ Their fear, that why do they not let business and they do not let uh, sales distract them from giving money and establishing salah? By the way, establishing salah could be for yourself, could be also for your family. The man is supposed to establish salah, not just in, him, in and of himself, but in his kids, in his wife even. That's his, he's supposed to go and wake them up. That's his job first and foremost. I'm saying it like the laziest person alive, but still, okay. What are they afraid of though? They're afraid what's motivating them is the fear of a certain day where their hearts and their eyes are going to be turned and looked at. تَتَقَلَّبُ فِيهِ الْقُلُوبُ وَالْأَبْصَارِ couple meanings behind this. Number one, literally, by the way, قلب, uh, the heart, it's قلب uh, is to turn. So the heart is something that turns. Meaning, you know, you love something one day, the next day you forgot whatever. You know, you, you like someone one day and then you forget their name and then you want this job and then you don't and then you pick this college and then what college and then what, it turns. The thing that you love, the thing that you want, the thing that you think about, it's always changing, okay? That heart will be constantly turning. تَتَقَلَّبُ Mudare means like it's constantly happening, non-stop. Why is it turning? Because of fear of what's happening on the day. What's happening on the day? وَالْأَبْصَارِ And the, the eyes are turning. 
and they're looking at everything happening around them and they're not even allowed to scream. Ya Allah, I just want to be in your light on that day. I'm going to go to Asha. I don't care how much money I'm losing out on. I don't care how busy things are getting. I'm going to Jummah. I'm going to Fajr. I'm going to Asha. That's, Ya Allah, I'm just afraid of that day. There's another more awkward version of this that I'm going to allude to. And I'm really, you know how I told, how we had Al-Sahar for the last passage, talking about like the logic of faith and all that kind of stuff and whatever. I have someone else, I'm not going to confirm because she didn't confirm yet, but I couldn't think of a better person to invite so that we have another conversation about this part. And I think I'm going to end it with this part actually. This could also mean that not just the hearts are being turned out of fear and the eyes out of fear, but that it's as if it's like the imagery of you have this like heart and you're looking in it, تتقلب, you're turning it to look inside of it. Is something wrong with it? And not just the heart, but what else? The eyes. What's happening in these eyes? What, what do these eyes do? It's interesting that men are afraid of what the eyes might have inside. Just like before in the surah, Allah said twice, hammered it in, lower the gaze. You understand where I'm going? They're afraid of what their eyes did. I don't want to spell that out too much. Not too much. I will call out though, what's amazing about the surah, nearly the first, you can read it yourself and you can tell me your thoughts too. The first 30, 40% and the last like 10% are basically about um, sexuality and zina. And not just zina, but like even halal, yani whatever intercourse and stuff like that. That's what Nur covers, like almost half of Nur is about that. Which is so strange that this amazing philosophical spiritual example is in the middle of conversations about what again? Zina. And by the way, their hudud, their laws. When, when you find out someone did zina, here's what you do to them. When you find a man who claims, who, who says this woman did zina and he's lying, you do not accept his word in court ever again. That's in Quran. You know that? I don't know if that's a very not known hudud of Allah. That if you catch a man in Sharia Allah, Sharia, Sharia Allah sounds so strange. In the Sharia, in the law of Allah, if a man is caught saying that this woman did zina and he's lying, he is, there's, uh, forget the first part of it. The second part of it though is so there's a hudud, there's a punishment for him. But the second part is after that punishment is done, he's officially a fasik. He's not allowed, not you. That person, not you, that person is not allowed for his word to be accepted in a court of law because he's a liar. He did the ultimate lie of lying against the purity of a woman. All and even, by the way, there's, there's, it's so beautiful. Men who use, sell women to prostitution, Allah even has something about that where he tells those women, because you are forced, don't worry, I'm ghafur rahim. It's not on you. It's on him. And you know why this gives me goosebumps? There are women who need to hear that, yes or no? Yes. Is there not a woman that she reads that and she's like, oh my God, I had no idea. And she's crying like, ya Allah, I had no idea. I, I, I really don't want to do this, ya Allah. And Allah says, wa in Allah ba'da ikrahihim, after them being forced, in Allah ghafur rahim. He's ghafur, he's rahim, he's, he's forgiving, he's merciful to you. Meaning, he's, this is not on you, it's on him. All of these hadood and all of these rulings about zina and about when should the child enter the bedroom of the mother and father even. In the middle you have this beautiful spiritual, what is the connection between sexuality and zina and nur? This is what exposes the connection. These men are afraid of what will be found in what? The hearts and the eyes. Meaning that one of the main ways to make that glass filthy is what the eyes consume. What the eyes choose to look at, that is the number one thing men should fear, first of all. And second of all, is the thing that could be the first and foremost compromising aspect of the light that Allah gave you, is zina and its adjacent stuff. I don't, need, I do, I don't want to spell it out too much. Are you guys following what I'm saying here? Beautiful though, right? Beautiful. Like it's just when you look at the real estate of the surah, it's like literally, here's how I think of it. It's like you have, you know, house, 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 house. And then for some reason, the city planner put a circus in the middle or something. Like what is that doing there? Why is that there? 
It's the same thing here. Hudud, law, 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 zina, law, law, law. Allahu nur samawati wal ard. What is that doing here? What it's doing there is it's connecting the sanctity of a family. Because what is zina? Why is zina one of the worst things you can do? Because it destroys families. Destroys families. It is, like the Prophet said, oh no, I'm sorry, no, this is, that's for Hasad. But it really is like, like fire to firewood. You want to get burned, zina. It's a quick way to lose the light in your heart. He's connecting the sanctity of the household to light. And this is the number one way to ruin that light is zina. And it's adjacent stuff. Beautiful connection. Really beautiful connection there. I, I need to finish. I'm sorry. I'm just going to finish really quick. We'll do it quickly. Allahu ahsana ma amilu. So that, what else is their, these men's motivation? So that they can be rewarded by Allah. So that Allah can reward them, I'm sorry. Ahsana ma amilu, with the best of what they've done. I'll tell you what that means in a second. وَيَزِيدَهُمْ مِنْ فَضْلِهِ And so that he can increase from his favor. وَاللَّهُ يَرْزُكُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ بِغَيْرِ حساب. And Allah gives provision to whoever he wants without any accounting whatsoever. Meaning, what does that mean without any accounting? Sometimes you have a friend that lends you five bucks, but they're like, uh, in seven minutes, they're like, hey, it's uh, interest accrued, it's five and, five and two cents. I'll, I'll check you again tomorrow with, a, with an update. Like, that's hisab. Like, they want every penny back. Allah, be laid hisab. I'm going to give you and there's no hisab. You're not going to get judged for this. I'm going to give you and there's nothing, nothing in return. In this life and in the afterlife. But what does this mean? That Allah will reward you for the best of what you do? Here's a really stupid example that kind of fits it, okay? Imagine you, you take a, you, a, a class in college and it's an extremely difficult class. And there's five tests. And you get a 35%, a 40%, a 50%, mashallah. You're like a student like I was in college. A 65%. But then for some reason your brain kicked on in the last test and you got a 95. Somehow. Just because, I don't know how, you finally used your brain like a lawnmower, like, and it turned on and smoke left your ear, and you actually read the material, and Mashallah got a 95%. Imagine you went to the teacher, and you're basically failing the class, by the way, you're getting a D at best, right? But you go to the teacher, and what she does is she takes that 95 and crosses out the 35 and puts a 95, and crosses out the 54 and puts a 95, and crosses out the 43 and puts a 95. <laughs> He rewards with whatever your highest, best thing. That's what becomes all your deeds. What a, what a deal, dude. That's, that's crazy. Wallah, that's insane. This should give us so much hope, Wallah. Like, look how, I swear, Judgment Day sometimes is scary. And Wallah, we should be afraid. Obviously, like they fear a day. We're supposed to fear that day. But man, sometimes, and if you look at it another way, it's as if the pur one of the purposes of that day is for Allah to give you any excuse not to burn. Like any, any, literally anything. Just give me something. As if he's saying, just give me something. Like there's a famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ where he tells a story from an old Muslim nation that happened to be, she was a prostitute. Which you can imagine, even in the light of this surah, not great, bad stuff, bad career, not a good career choice. However, what happened once, she saw a, um, a dog so thirsty that he's licking a rock. You know, and I've seen, this, I've seen a cat thirsty, by the way, like this in Saudi Arabia, in Mecca. So thirsty they lick rocks. I don't know why, they, but they, that's a sign of thirst apparently. But anyway, it's in the desert, he's licking a rock. And she takes water in her shoe and feeds the dog. And, and the Prophet taught us, she goes to Jannah because of that. What? What are you talking about? Why? Like to us, I'd be like, that's not fair. What are you talking about? Allah is not fair. Allah is way too merciful to be fair. He's fair with criminals. Justice is for criminals in Allah's eyes. Fairness and justice is not for believers. The believers get the C-suite, dude. They get VIP. You gave an apple to a kid once, dude. Go to the highest level, man. Like, be light hisab. Just go. I don't want to see your book. I don't care what you highlighted. Just go. Look at the thing you did. But what is a prerequisite to having that is the fear. When you're a man, I'll extend it to women. When you're a person that you fear that day, to the extent that like, I don't care what I gain, I'm not disobeying Allah. I'm going to go to his house. I'm going to remember him often in my own house, whatever the case may be, whatever your situation is. I'm going to remember Allah. I'm not going to let anything take me away from Allah. When you have that fear, then you're a person that you could mess up a thousand times and do one thing right. And Allah's like, yeah, but he did that thing right that one time. No, he's good. No, no. 
He's going through. No judgment for him. He's going through. She's going through. SubhanAllah. May Allah make us of these people. And may Allah make us of these men that Allah is talking about, inshallah. I'm sorry, I took a lot longer than I thought I would. Um, what I want to do maybe for at least 15 minutes, I'll open up for...